um, thank you to the organisers for giving me the opportunity to, to come back to Australia. Um, it's, it's always a, a pleasant occasion to, to come back and visit. So, so we are going to turn our thinking to, to the setting that most of us practice in and, and the luxurious setting where, where we do have the resources and the time and the potential to think not just about the survival of our patients but also about the recovery of our patients. And, and some of the things that we've done over the time to, to think about how, how we can improve um, how our patients recover. So what do we know at this point about recovery after critical illness? We certainly know there's widespread evidence of new or worsening compromise in our patients in terms of their physical, their cognitive and their psychological function. And we know that that compromise extends for, for months to years. It's something that is not gone a week or a two weeks or even a month after they leave our care in the intensive care unit. We also know that their pre-morbid condition before they've come into um, our, our care and before their critical illness affects that recovery. And I'll talk in some more detail in a moment, but we also know that there's very different patterns and speed of recovery for our patients. Um, and we need to think about what that means. So I guess in knowing that, and we now have lots of studies that have documented how our patients recover and what those, those areas of compromise are. What we have at the moment, does that give us enough information to enable us to, to meet our patients' needs? So certainly when we think about what do we know about our patients' needs, what do we know about what they're looking for from us? Um, there's been a few uh, papers and uh, various forums in the last uh, four or five years that have started to really document this information. And probably the first of these was a stakeholder conference that was held five years or so ago, and the results were published in 2012. And at that stakeholder conference was predominantly critical care clinicians from various disciplines with two patients within that group. Um, so a small voice from patients and mostly critical care clinicians. And then a couple of years after that was a publication in the UK that was about priorities for future intensive care research. And this was funded by the James Lind Alliance, which is a group that funds working in partnership with patients and their families to look at how we can change and improve care. And so this was a document that had the voices of fairly equal numbers of patients, family members, and critical care clinicians. And although it's priorities across all of intensive care research, a lot of the priorities were related to how patients recover and what they were looking for after their critical illness. In the same year as that, there was a paper um, that was a follow-on from that first stakeholder meeting that was led by Doug Elliott from Sydney. Um, and that was exploring a bit wider view of recovery that had non-critical care clinicians and, again, a couple of patients there. And then, as well as these more formal documents from groups of people, you'll find a, a selection of usually individual or small group reports, um, often conducted as qualitative research, about patients and how they've rebuilt their life after their critical illness. But what we haven't done is in any systematic or broad scale, we haven't asked our patients what do you want from recovery? What does recovery look like from you? What does that mean for you after you leave our care? One of the things that I've done, and this is in the trauma population, not in an intensive care population. Some of these people will have been in the intensive care unit, but not all of them. And this was where we asked patients, clinicians, and family members what recovery meant to them. And in the middle of this um, slide, in the middle of the three circles, where the three circles intersect, 
were the things that all three groups of stakeholders talked about. So they talked about returning to work. They talked about resuming family roles, achieving independence. A lot of people talked about recapturing normality. So what does that mean? It means something different for every single patient. They would frequently say, I just want life to be normal again. And they talked about achieving comfort. But they were the areas of commonality. What we also found was that up the top, just under the label of patients, patients talked about development of self, and they were the only group that talked about developing themselves. They often talked about, this is a reminder of why I'm on this earth, this is a reminder of what I can achieve, and this is what I need to, to develop and take the opportunity. In the other areas, you can see some overlap between either the family members and the patients or the patients and the clinicians. There were two areas that the clinicians were the only people that spoke about. One of those was realignment of life goals, and one was psychological recovery. You will see that patients and family members spoke of restoring emotional stability, but that was meant in a bit different fashion to um, the, the various members of the trauma team talking about psychological recovery. So this is trauma patients. We don't have any similar sense of what um, our patients after critical illness describe as recovery. Now, if we look at the various reviews that exist around how we might help patients recover, and I've, I've focused predominantly on Cochrane reviews, although there are a whole lot of other systematic reviews that pretty much say the same thing in the areas of recovery. Um, if we look at the review on exercise rehabilitation after critical illness, led by uh, Bronwyn Connolly, one of the physios from London, the take-home message, insufficient evidence to tell us what works. If we look at the review on physical rehabilitation for people with um, functional problems, uh, again, the take-home message, no evidence. If we look at the review that we did on diaries after critical illness, insufficient evidence to support the use of it as an intervention. If we look at reviews on all sorts of other interventions to do with cognitive function, follow-up clinics, early mobilisation, we get the same sort of message, insufficient evidence or conflicting evidence or no evidence. But in all of the studies that have been taken into those reviews, there's always some patients who benefit from the various interventions just not enough for it to give us uh, a widespread message. And so this really started us thinking about um, some of the work that we'd done that was led by Doug Elliott, that some of you will be, be familiar with this study. It was an RCT of home-based rehabilitation that was first published about four or five or six years ago. And as a, an overall intervention, we had exactly the same sort of issue where um, for the whole group, the intervention didn't provide benefit to our patients. But when we looked at things like what factors, can we find what factors predicted our psychological recovery in this group of patients, we were able to find certain factors and certain patients that did have benefit from a psychological recovery point of view. And so it was things like uh, gender predicted recovery, week one stress, so the stress that patients reported one week after hospital discharge predicted recovery. When we looked at exactly the same aspect but in regard to the physical function of these patients as they recovered, again there were certain characteristics that predicted which patients benefited from these interventions. So as an overall, we can't find benefit, but there are some patients that benefit. What does that tell us? We also went on to look at this in a group of about, um, a group of trauma intensive care patients that we'd studied for 24 months, and we didn't deliver an intervention for these patients. What we did was simply follow their recovery over 24 months. But a couple of the characteristics that we measured through that time period were illness perception and self-efficacy. And we, when we looked at the predictors of both physical function and mental health over that 24 months, 
both of those characteristics predicted or were associated with how patients recovered and which patients recovered more effectively or more completely than, than other patients. So is this telling us that there's a whole lot more going on here than just thinking about the, the physical function or the psychological function, that there's some characteristics of these patients that we haven't necessarily thought about that we need to start thinking about. Um, similar to that, there's been some work over the last six or seven years that's really recognised that our patients have different trajectories after their recovery. And, and this work comes from Jack Hiroshina's work um, that he's really tied together a, a lot of this work. And what this shows you is that each of the A, B and C trajectories here are different types of pathways that patients follow. So the top, um, the top element of this slide is, is characterising the typical healthy young individual that comes into our intensive care unit. And even within that group, there's three different pathways that they tend to follow. There's the, what's been labelled as the big hit group of patients where they, they have a significant reduction with their critical illness, but then they get over that critical illness fairly quickly and recover in a fairly straight line pathway after that. There's the slow burn group of patients that recover to a certain extent, but still go downhill after that critical illness. And there's a group of patients that have relapsing recurrences throughout their recovery. And you can see that in each of those areas, and that was the healthy young individuals at the top, or the young subject with um, altered pre-morbid status, or the older patient with pre-morbid problems, they each have different pathways. So we need to think that our patients do recover differently, not just in a simple, similar fashion. We found the same when we looked at psychological health. So this was Isabel Castillo, one of my PhD students, who looked at psychological health over uh, six months after critical illness. And the green boxes are where patients were describing their depression scores um, in a fashion that wasn't symptomatic. The red boxes were uh, patients describing symptomatic um, problems with, with depression. And um, so this was a, in the hospital wards in three months and six months. And you can see that some people start off reporting problems but get better of their own accord. Some people start off quite happily but then have problems afterwards. So there's different patterns in regard to psychological health as well as physical health. So what do we know? There's extensive and significant compromise to all aspects of health. And universal interventions have failed to show benefit. We know that pre-critical illness condition certainly affects recovery. As I said, we know that they have different trajectories of recovery. But is there something else that's going on to explain who recovers and who doesn't? So this is really capturing how we think about things at the moment. So we, we know that there's dysfunction in regard to physical, psychological and cognitive function and we target those areas in our interventions to try and improve the eventual recovery that patients um, experience. We also recognise, and there's a reasonable amount of evidence, that various things like age, the social circumstances, for example, do they live with somebody at home or not, their primary diagnosis, their pre-ICU state and their, their comorbidities affect that recovery. We've also now in recent years recognised that their trajectory will make a difference to how re we recover. What I'm suggesting that there's another box that moderates how people recover. And at this stage I've labelled it as self-care and self-help behaviours. I don't really know what belongs in this box. I'm thinking that we have some beginning evidence that things like self-efficacy, resilience, coping, illness perception, mindfulness, there's a whole range of these characteristics that we have started to look at. And just for uh, very quickly, for those of you who are not overly familiar with, it, with any of these concepts, 
Self-efficacy is really about people's judgments on their capabilities to organise and execute courses of action. So how they, they um, get on with life. Illness perception is about how much a person believes their illness or their injury affects what they can do and how they will recover. Um, and resilience is the, the process of adapting well in the face of adversity, trauma, tragedy, threats, or even significant sources of threat. Um, so they're three of the concepts um, that have started to be looked at. So this work that was published just last year looked at resilience in survivors of critical illness in the context of survivors' experience and recovery. And the purpose of this work was to examine the association between resilience and function in 43 medical ICU survivors. Now, in measuring resilience in this group of patients, they found that just over a quarter of that small group of patients had low levels of resilience. The rest had normal or, or high levels. But importantly, they did find that resilience was inversely correlated with self-reported executive dysfunction, anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress, difficulty with self-care and pain. In other words, when resilience was high, things like anxiety and depression were low, and the converse to that. Um, this is another study along a very, very similar theme. It was 218 ICU admissions in 186 ICU survivors. And again, it's just come from last year. The outcome they were looking at was that functional recovery, in other words, returning to a disability level or a disability score that was equal to or less than their pre-ICU score. And importantly, recovery was associated with a higher BMI, which I'm quite happy about that. Um, but perhaps more importantly, uh, a greater functional self-efficacy. So those who had a higher belief about their ability to get on with things, a higher self-efficacy -eff score, did consider that they recovered better in terms of what they wanted. Um, this is some work out of Ireland, and I don't know if Danny McCauley is here yet, but Danny McCauley, who is speaking in this program, was one of the co-investigators on this, where they looked at a six-week RCT rehabilitation program for 60 patients. And importantly, again, they found no difference in the primary outcome at six weeks. But improvements at six weeks were associated with a couple of things, and the things down the bottom of that list were self-efficacy to exercise and readiness to exercise. Now, that was at six weeks. At six months, only the concept of readiness to exercise. So the belief that they were ready to exercise uh, retained improvement at six months. Very small study at this stage, but maybe suggesting something there for us. Now, this was one of the earliest studies in the, the broad critical care cohort that was done in this area. And this was actually out of Auckland and published 15 years ago, where they did an RCT for 65 patients um, after their first MI. And there were, the intervention basically consisted of three sessions where they attempted to improve people's perceptions, illness perceptions. And in those sessions, they did an explanation of the pathophysiology, dealt with their uh, beliefs about their MI, um, conducted some planning for minimising future risk, and also some discussion about symptoms of recovery. And in that small group of patients, this intervention resulted in some really quite positive changes in um, patients about their views for MI. They felt better prepared for leaving hospital, Amazingly, in such a small group, they actually returned to work sooner in the intervention group, and they had lower rate of angina symptoms at three months. So a very small study, but with some really quite good uh, early results. This is some work that was published a few years ago now that was a pilot study of coping skills. 
And up until about a week ago, that's where I was going to have to leave this in this presentation. But the larger study just came out um, a week ago. And so this is the follow-on study of that, where out of America they've done an RCT of the patient plus family member, where there was a, a family member, not always the dyad. And they compared a telephone-based coping skills training program compared to an educational program. And the reason for there being an educational program was ethically they weren't allowed to deliver no care in the, in the usual care group. They were randomised after a baseline telephone interview and stratified based on the baseline psychological distress of the patient, the length of mechanical ventilation and their study site. Their primary outcome was hospital anxiety and depression scores at six months, and they did note a priori that they were planning to do subgroup analysis based on those baseline strata. strata. Um, the intervention, as I said, was a coping skill training program that was delivered via the phone and it was delivered uh, by a psychologist and consisted of six 30-minute sessions. And you can see the education training there was generally dealing with uh, the problems of recovery after critical illness, but quite specifically avoided any mention of psychological distress. They randomised 175 patients. Now, the bit that I'm a, quite surprised at was that they defined intervention adherence as only one or more phone calls out of that six-week plan for the coping skills training. So I'm surprised that they considered just participating in one phone call was actually intervention adherence. And even using that fairly limited uh, definition, only 63% of people actually even did that. Um, intervention adherence in the education group was self-reported viewing of the materials and again was, was just around two-thirds. Now, disappointingly, the results are that no significant difference between the groups in the HADS was found at six months, but I actually think the, the strength of the intervention needs to be seriously looked at. Um, but they did find on those a priori um, analyses that the patients who had a higher level of anxiety and depression did report a higher um, improved HADS and a higher level of self-efficacy at six months. So it may be that this is an intervention that's targeted at the people that are having problems very early rather than being relevant for the whole group of patients, which fits with what we've been seeing in all the other work. So what can we take from this? Certainly recovery means different things for different people. Our patients do have recovery pathways. Some behavioural characteristics appear to influence recovery and are potentially modifiable. And it is absolutely time we moved away from a one-size-fits-all approach. We don't have a problem with thinking that different patients will need different inotropes or different fluids or different antibiotics. We have to be thinking exactly the same for these sorts of interventions. Um, and we need to develop and test a range of interventions for different individual patients or phenotypes or groups of patients. So what might this look like? Well, I'm suggesting that maybe a none of this is tested. This is a suggestion. Maybe we need to develop an individual list of priorities of recovery for each individual patient and look at what challenges they perceive they're going to have to their recovery. We also perhaps need to screen for baseline characteristics, and that might be their pre-critical illness um, condition, as well as characteristics like illness perception, self-efficacy, resilience, etc. We then need to create an individualised plan for rehabilitation, and that might be things like strategies for communication, interaction with primary care providers, physical aids, um, certain therapy services for each individual patient, certain psychosocial interventions for each individual patient. And obviously we're going to need uh, regular, uh, regular follow-up because as you saw in all of those um, areas where we've looked at trajectory, some people will be doing fine early and have problems later. We can't assume that because they leave our doors healthy that they're going to stay that way. <clears throat> 
So I really do think, I know it's a pun, but I really do think this is the tip of the iceberg. I think we've been looking at the bit of the iceberg we can see, and we've been forgetting that our patients are a whole lot more com complex than that, and there's a whole lot more going on underneath that we need to start thinking about because that's what is likely to predict how our patients actually receive the interventions we deliver and actually recover after their critical illness. Thank you.